this is David Gary for CMIPFX. I'm really proud to introduce you to this video called Houdini Fundamentals, which is where at CMIPFX you will enter the world of Houdini, where it all begins. Houdini is certainly the most powerful existing 3D package, and its way to work is absolutely unique in the world of CG, in general, I mean not just in 3D. And it's really unlike anything you've ever seen. I'm not going to do some publicity here, but let let me just remind you of this fact that Houdini has received a Technical Achievement Award in 2002 for its procedural approach. It hasn't been given this award just because it was a, a good heap of features that were just well packaged together, but really because it was a new way to work created to give you an unprecedented level of flexibility, of speed, and maybe most importantly I would say of understanding of what you are doing. But of course this is a new world, there's a lot of things to discover, there's new habits to take, and it can be at the same time very exciting but maybe a little scary. So I'll do my best to make you enjoy learning and working with Houdini as much as I did, and I hope even more. So all along the lesson, all along the examples, what you'll have to really understand is how data flows in Houdini within the networks and between the different networks because that's really what Houdini is all about. Your workflow, the way you use to work, is Houdini's own data flow, the way it represents its data, and vice versa, its data flow will be your own workflow. It will be one single thing. Exactly like a language that will help express your ideas even faster. So before we can talk, before we can make long sentences or produce poetry, okay, we need to learn the language. We need to learn the logic of Houdini, the philosophy of Houdini. So here we are at the beginning of our long trip into the vast land of Houdini. And instead of immediately rushing into modeling something or animating something or immediately pressing on this button, that button, let's take a deep breath. And what we need when we explore such a vast country is to have a good map, not to get lost somewhere. And then we are going to zoom into a particular region. And indeed, the first thing you need to know about Houdini is that it is divided in regions, into areas, into departments. And I think the best metaphor for that is to say that Houdini is like a big house with several rooms that are clearly separated. Like in a house, you've got the kitchen, you've got the bedroom, you've got the garage, and in the kitchen you cook, in the bedroom you sleep, in the garage you park your car and you are not going to cook in the garage or in the bedroom, okay? Where this is the same here, you've got some clear rooms where you accomplish a specific task. Of course, these different rooms are going to communicate, to talk one with each other. But at first, they are clearly separated. And these rooms are called the different contexts of Houdini. We've got several contexts. For instance, you've got the context where you model, you've got the context where you animate, you've got the context where you create your shaders, you've got the context where you do some compositing, okay? And each of these contexts has some views associated with them, some dedicated view. For example, when you model, you need to have your 3D viewport. When you are working, compositing, you need to have your image, you need to have a compositing view, okay? Or when you are working with animation curve, you need to see your curves. So for each context, you've got some viewers, some panels associated. And since in each context you work with nodes, you always have in each of these contexts the node view that we call, in fact, the network view. Because there are some networks of nodes. For example, if I go into the compositing context, 
which is here. I double click and let's bring here a file operator which is going to load an image from the disk. Okay, and here you see that we've got a composite view which is a dedicated view for the compositing context. Okay, and here I'm going to add some other operators, for example, to turn the image into black and white. Okay, you've got the child context, which is the context into which you are going to manipulate the animation curves. Okay, and which has a dedicated view. Well, you don't find it here by default, so what you can do is to press here on the plus button and bring here new pen tab type and bring the motion view. Double click and here I'm going to create a special animation curve which will be a sinusoidal wave. Okay. So this is a special view for this network. Okay. Etc. Etc. And a very important thing, each of these contexts has a special color, a dedicated color. Like here, the animation context is in, actually it's orange. The compositing context is brown. The modeling context is, you need to create a geometric container, is green, etc., etc. If you do not see these colors by default, which can happen in some releases, in some builds of Houdini, just go in here under Edit, Preferences, General User Interface, and if it's not the case, just turn on Color Pane Headers with Network Context. If it's not the case, you'll see here that all the colors are grey, which is hard for us to tell where exactly we are in Houdini, in which context. Fortunately, we've got here on each context a little text that tells you that. Here it tells you that you are in a geometry context. That here you are in the compositing networks. That here you are in the motion networks, etc. etc. So here I'm going to bring back this color. Besides, it's prettier with the colors. Okay, so we've got this context. Okay, in each of these contexts, you've got at least the network view, and since you are working with nodes, here double click, you've got the view for the parameter of each node of each operator, like here for the monocop, where you've got options on how to perform the color to black and white conversion to grayscale conversion like using the hue, the uh, blue component, etc. etc. So you've got at least in each context the network view and the parameter view. So let's talk about all these contexts. The first context and the most often used is the green context, the context of modeling where you are working with operators which are called the surface operator because they are used for modeling operation okay they are called the subs so here you've got the network view you've got the parameter view and the viewer is of course your 3d scene okay you've got some additional view like here the geometry spreadsheet where you've got the list of the coordinates of each point of the geometry okay we've got the compositing context where you are working with compositing operators called the COPS, okay, like the COPS, with a dedicated composite view where you composite your image, with of course the parameter view and some additional viewers like the histogram or a specific timeline here. We've got the context of animation, of nonlinear animation, of animation curve where you are working with channel operators. A channel is actually an animation curve. So they are called the chops. You've got this particular context where you visually program your shaders 
using the VEX operators. VEX is the name of the language embedded with Houdini, one of the languages. And we'll see that this shading language that VEX is can be applied to other contexts than the shading context. And to do other things than creating shaders, to create, for example, deformers or, or, for example, to write some advanced particle expressions. These are called the VOPs, the VEX operators. This is the purple context. You've got the pink or salmon context, which is the context of the shops, the shading operators, where your nodes represent your shader and where is not a lot of connection between nodes involved, but where you still have these nodes and with a shader view associated. You've got the, I would say, the Bordeaux context of the dynamic operators, where you perform some dynamic simulation. These dynamic operators are called the DOPs, and they are dynamic objects there are solvers, there are forces okay, that you connect together to have a dynamic simulation. And this is where you are working with fluids. Fluids do not have a specific context, which would be called the, the flops, for example. No, no. Fluids are dops. Okay. And you've got the blue-green context of particles, where you found the particle operators, which are kind of rules that you apply to your particle systems. So you've got particle operators called the POPs. In fact, we also have a last context, which is the context of the rendering nodes. But they do not really act like nodes that you plug together. I mean, you can plug them together, but most of the time you use them as just buttons to launch the render. For example, here I've got the Mantra node, which launch Mantra. Mantra is the name of uh, Houdini's renderer. And if you press here, this bring this panel. And if you press here, this is going to launch the renderer. Okay. So here is the map of the country, or if you prefer, the blueprint of the house, with all the different rooms that you access with this toggle bar on each pane. Okay. And this gives you an overview of what you can find in Houdini. Now you also have some additional views that are context independent, that live outside of this context, like uh, the channel editor. The channel editor is a quick editor to do some simple animation tasks, like uh, adjusting the keyframes. This lives outside the context, and as a result, it do not have a specific color. Okay, here if you press this plus button, if here I bring a Python shell, well, Python, the Python shell lives outside this context. The text port, which is the shell for the A script language as well, okay, I'm going to close them. And since you find nodes everywhere, in every context, there's another important thing about this context, that at the same time as being context, there are also some folders of a big directory structure that you can see here, and which in another way represent the whole map of Houdini. Okay. Here with the roots and here with the different context into which you are going to find your nodes. Okay. So this is another representation of the land of Houdini with a big directory structure. You'll see that this representation is also very, very useful. So you've got networks as folders and the files are your operators. Okay. So everywhere you find yourself in Houdini, you are in a place in this directory structure. And you can see that here. That here I'm under slash image slash comp1, etc. 
with the additional thing that let's go there. What we can do, and which is an ID which came with the latest version of Houdini, which is that you can plug or branch some directories into some other directories. What I mean is that here, in this compositing context, what I can do, I need to bring what I call a manager, and I can bring inside this compositing context a channel context. Here, if I double click, here you see that I am in a channel context into which I can, for example, bring a wave chop and into which I can branch another network, for example, a modeling network. If I double click, and here I can create a grid, for example, that I can see here. Okay? And this is perfectly reflected in here that I was in this context into which I had a chop network, into which I have the wave, and into which I have a sub network, etc. etc. So you can have nested contexts, nested networks if you want. This is useful for several reasons. This is useful when you want to collapse everything into a single operator that we call a digital set. We'll see that at the end. And this is also useful when you want to have all your networks close one to each other. For example, instead of having to toggle here to access all my networks, I want to stay in this network, in this context, and have all the other contexts here, accessible here. Okay. So this is another way to represent the Houdini map. Okay, with directories, folders, and files. Okay, and each operator thus have a path. Is somewhere in the directory structure of D. Now several additional things to say about the workspace. The first thing is that your workspace is divided, as you can see, in panes that you can move around like that. You can even swap two panes together, like that, like that, like that again, okay. And that each of these panes contain several tabs, contains different views. You can add some other views, like another uh, motion view, for example, etc. So this makes a lot of different view, a lot of different viewers accessible from the workspace. Okay. What you can do here, if for example use a composite view, is to maximize it to bring it full screen. If for example you're working on a big image, or you can do the same if you are in a network view with a lot of different nodes. Okay. Like that. What you can do is to close a pane mode. If you do that, it will close all the tabs that are inside this pane, okay? Using this arrow, close pane, it close all the tabs. But of course you can do the opposite, you can split again your workspace, either left, right, or top, bottom. Here I'm going to choose top, bottom. And then again, I don't know, for example, left, right. Okay. It's no use splitting your workspace too much as long as in each pane you've got several views, okay, and that you can add new views like a composite view, like uh, a bundle list, etc., etc. This already makes a lot of view accessible. Now about this view, what I'm going to do first is to create a new compositing network which will bring another composing context. By default, all the panes are independent. For example, here, if I press here, I'm into the network view of the compositing context, while here I'm in the scene view of the object context. So the view are not related, but you can link them together. Here, if you pin 
like it's the case here, a panel or view, it always stays the same. Okay. But what I want to do is to link, for example, these two views together. What I need to do, okay, this brings me back to the object level. So let's be at the object level. What I can do is here to choose a number and assign the same number here so that the views will be linked, okay? And all the panes that have the number 2 will be linked together. Here if I choose 2, these two views are linked together, okay? If I go inside, or if I go into here, an image context, and if here I shift to a composite view, okay, if here I go into comp1, I'm into comp1, but if here I want to go into image1, here I'm in image1, okay, this follows. That's it. That's all there is in terms of the interface, the context, the different view associated with its context, and into each context, the nodes in the network view, the operators. And you bring the operator using just the tab key. And this brings the list of the nodes that you can select. For example, here I select the file cop. Okay, another way to bring the operator is you press the tab key and you type the first letters of the operator, like F, I, L. This is sufficient, and this brings me a file cop. And that is the same in every context. For example, let's go into the modeling context. So let's bring a scene view. If I want to create a grid, I just press tab, G, R, I, D. Okay, I want to extrude it, so I will use a poly extrude, poly extrude sub, and that's all there is to do, creating nodes and plugging them together. In every context, it's always the same, and all the nodes are just here in front of you, just one tab key away. Okay, here in the geometry context. Here in the compositing context, here in the channel context, etc, etc. That's all there is in terms of the interface, then the context and the node inside. And the nodes, the interface for the node, which is just here, live inside each context, okay, is dependent on the context you are in. And your daily job is to create nodes and plug them together, okay? We'll see that there's a little more than that. But basically, that's all there is, okay? And here, I'm sure you're going to add the question, but what about here, these little buttons, little icons, these shelves? Haha, <laughs> you're right. But this button, this little icon that you can press, don't do anything else, anything different than creating nodes and plugging them together. Only they can create several nodes at once and connect them together. So they are just macro of the kind of action, the kind of operation you do here. Okay? Let's let's show that on an example. Okay, let's delete that. What I'm going to do is to create a very simple uh, dynamic simulation. The point is not to create a dynamic simulation, the point is to show you how pressing here is completely equivalent to manually creating nodes and plugging them together. What I'm going to do is to make a bold bounce on a simple grid object. So let's create here a grid, tab GRID grid, okay, this creates a geometry container with the grid inside, okay. Let's create a sphere on top of this grid. So just tab and sphere, okay. 
Here, if I move my cursor, I stay in the XZ plane, okay? But if I want to move along the Y axis, I just press Alt and I move, for example, and if I release here Alt, I'm at another altitude, okay? And place the sphere here. I want it to be a polygonal sphere. Here we got the primitive type polygon. Okay. So to perform my simulation, what I'm going to do is to tell that this is a rigid body, this is a rigid body, and these two rigid body will collide. So here I go into the dedicated tab, the dedicated shell, where I've got here this RBD object operation. I've got my sphere selected here and I press RBD object. These create a specific node, a specific network actually, which contain the nodes for my dynamic simulation. Okay, we are in a DOPT network. But each of these nodes are nodes that I could have created manually. Here I could have created a RBD object which is here. Here I could have created manually a RBD solver, which is here. Here I could have manually created a gravity force and connected these nodes together. Okay. This is to show you that what I did here was just a macro, was just a shortcut of some operation made on nodes. Okay. Okay, if I it play, the ball go through the grid. Because I need to say that this grid is another rigid body object. So I select the grid and press RBD object. Okay, This brings me another RBD object into the dot network. Okay, If I press play, we get a little problem because both objects are affected by the gravity here. So what I want to do is to connect only the sphere to the gravity and move this a little bit. We want this to be an active rigid body and the grid to be what we call a passive rigid body, which means that it's not going to move but it will accept collision. Okay. Don't pay attention to this dynamic consideration. The point is nodes, okay, and I merge them together. Okay, it's better if I display it like that. No, oh, it's okay. So, so these icons, these shells, are nothing but shortcuts to classical node operations. Okay, So they represent an additional layer of functionality if you want. But we want to stay at the level of the node so I'm going to hide this. And it remains a little menu bar here. Well the menu bar is not for creating nodes or modifying them. It is just to perform what I call the cosmetic tasks which is to customize your interface. You can uh, assign hotkeys, you can assign aliases and variables, which is to customize your workspace. Okay, And of course you've got the classical uh, file submenu where you can open a file, save a file and create a new file. Okay, But we can hide this as well so that we are just left with the nodes and the networks of nodes. And here we meet the fundamental difference with all the other applications, with all the classical applications. What you have in a classical application is you have on one side an interface with a lot of menus, submenus, a lot of heterogeneous menus, which are often here. Okay. And on the other side, the side which you don't see first, you've got what I call the core or the, the internal representation of the software, the underlying structure, in other terms what the software really does, 
when you press on this or that button of the interface? What are the base object the application is working on? Okay, what are the atoms and which can allow me to go beyond just using this button of the interface, really understanding what I'm doing. So in classical application, the interface wraps some functionalities of the core. For example, you can have in a classical application in the interface a button that tells create a fire effect. But create a fire effect means a lot of different things. It means creating particles. It means simulating the particles. It means attaching the particles to the object you want to burn, if you want to burn an object with this fire effect. It means creating a shader for all these particles. It means applying the shader to these particles. Okay. So a button of the interface can wrap several functionalities at once and work on several objects at once, a lot of different objects. So as soon as you want to chain your effect, you, you need to understand all these things. Okay. So when you learn a traditional app, you first learn the interface and you become very good at it. You're very good at pressing at this button and you know what happens roughly when you press this button. But you sooner or later feel that you do not quite entirely master what you are really doing when you are pressing on this button. You lack a, a feedback. You know, like, what am I doing? I mean, ultimately, what am I doing? And you feel that there's a kind of distant, an unpleasant distant, a gap between what you do and what the software itself does between this interface and the core. And you even got some application where you do not have access to the core, okay? To the internal representation where this access is denied, okay? So let's suppose it's a traditional app where you also have a good core that you can access. When, when you learn this app, you learn the interface, you're very good at it, but you want to go further, outside the predefined path. You want to do your own stuff. So you need to learn the application again, another time, and learn this time the core. Second step. Okay. Plus there is a third step, which is to understand how all the elements of the interface wraps all the elements of the core how they are related one with each other, okay? This is very time consuming, plus the organization, the relation between the interface and the objects vary with each element of interface, with each functionality. Well, in Houdini there is no such thing. The interface is the core and vice versa. There's nothing more than the nodes and there are nothing underneath the nodes. The interface is the core. This means it grants you access, immediately access to the core. And vice versa. This means that the core is brought to the surface. So you can get rid of this time of adaptation between okay I press this but what does it do and vice versa. If I want to do that where do I click, okay? You're immediately inside the core of Houdini. And here you say, ooh, the core of Houdini, ooh, that sounds really technical. That sounds, ooh, can't we wait a little bit? It, it's gonna get difficult. And then I say, no, not at all. The core is extremely simple. Well, it's, it's very simple. And that is the reason why it can be brought to the level of the interface. That's why you can directly work at the level of the core of the application. Because that is the most simple core there is. Okay? Nothing more than the nodes and the connection between the nodes. This is the core and this is the interface. But this you see that this raises a fundamental question, because if the objects I'm working on are these operations, and if they're nothing underneath, okay, what become of my good, my good old traditional objects? 
what becomes of my sphere, of my grids, of my image? I mean, where are they? They didn't disappear. Are there somewhere we didn't explore? At another level? Underneath the nodes? Somewhere else? No, no, they are here. In fact, they are inside the nodes. Just in front of you. And we'll see, really, the wonderful solution that Houdini has found right in the next lesson. This is a fundamental thing. The nodes in almost every context, I mean at least in the modeling context, the compositing context and the animation context, the chop context, are containers. They contain either some geometry or some image or some channels at the same time as being operators, which means that the operators also contain the data they are working on. So let's see that first on the modeling uh, context. And this is the first context we are going to zoom into. And the thing we are going to say about this context can be adapted to some extent to the other context. Okay? We are going to delete everything here. And let's go into the modeling context. Well, you do not have by default a modeling context. That is to say that the modeling context actually lives inside objects, live at, at a level which is inside some bigger networks, some bigger nodes. They live inside objects. We've got the object level, which is the blue context. Okay. So to access a modeling network, you first need to create a geometry container. And the easiest way to do that, which is actually the old way to do that, we'll see all the ways, is in here to create a geometry container. Tab Geometry. And to double click on it. And this bring, you see, the modeling context, which is green, and where you have all your modeling operations. And by default, it places a generator, which is a file SOP, okay, but which you can delete and replace by, for example, a grid, okay. So if you go back at this level, here you see that if you press tab at this level, you've got a lot of other objects, and you may ask yourself the question, what else is there than geometric nodes? Well, the other objects you find at this level are also geometric containers, but they have additional properties. For example, a light. Well, a light lives here, and light is a geometry container, but do not behave like a geometry container. Which means that here you can double click, and it contains a modeling network, which actually models this little helper this little helper geometry. But this little helper geometry is not used as geometry. For example, it is not rendered. It's just here for you to place your light, okay? To see your light. And if you press P here, which brings the parameter view, you've got additional tabs here in the interface of the node. This is a different node but we share some properties with the standard geometry container, okay? I'm gonna make myself some space here. I can press here just to minimize or to maximize this view if you prefer. A camera as well is a geometry container which contains here the actual camera which is not rendered either but which is used to orient your camera. Okay, if you click on it, you see some nodes, okay, some geometric nodes. Bones as well here. I create them here. Bones as well are geometric containers. Okay, if I double click on one, I have some geometric nodes, etc., etc. But here what I just want is a standard, is a basic geometry container. To create a geometry container, I can create it here 
as I just did or I can create it there in the viewport in which case I have more options and especially I can create a geometric container with a specific generator inside for example with a grid inside or with a sphere inside by here pressing tab and for example grid this will create a geometry container rename it to grid underscore object one and if you double click you've got a grid instead of a file okay which means that the operation that you have here although they have the same presentation as the nodes here well here they are not nodes they are just macro little macros of node operations like the grid here GRID is almost the same operation as the grid in here where here it creates a grid but at this level it creates a geometry container with a grid inside which is a little more the same goes for a sphere for example a sphere create a geometry container rename it to sphere object and which contain a sphere sop okay so all the classical uh, generators here like the box the curve throughout the sphere the tars have their corresponding macros here little macros here okay so here to show you the modeling workflow I'm going to model a simple glass or a simple cup if you prefer and I'm going to start with a curve that I'm going to revolve around here for example the y-axis so I want to draw the section of the glass or the cup in the XY plane so what I'm going to do here is actually to split here my view to have two views stacked a perspective view and here a right view here you see that if I click on here I can set some other view here I want the front viewport the front view okay you see that you've got the bottom the back the left UV is something very different we'll see that later so here I want the front viewport this split only the view and not the paint okay so I'm going to model my section here and what I want is to snap the, the points of my curve, the control vertices of my curve or the point if it's the vertices of a polygon to the point of the XY grid so what I'm going to do is here to click on grid snapping and here use a curve operation which you see creates a curve object with a curve inside okay so let's create it we want one point here okay like that like that like that okay like that and like that and press enter here you see it has created a curve stop inside press P and I want to change its type to nerves so that they are the control vertices of the nerves okay yes about the uh, navigation the camera navigation the first thing is you need to press the space bar and then if you press the left mouse button you tumble around which means you rotate around the center of the view not the center here the origin but the center of the view okay if you use the middle mouse button you will translate your camera if you want okay and if you use either the right mouse button or if you scroll if you have this on your mouse you zoom in and out 
Okay. So what I want to do now is to revolve this section, this cross section, around the y-axis. So I'm going to use a revolve SOP and connect it to the curve SOP. And you see that by default the direction is 0, 1, 0, which is the proper one. And here is my cup. Now let's suppose I want to have several copies, several identical copies of this cup, for example on a counter. Okay, what I'm going to do here is to use the copy sub, which is so to speak a geometry multiplier, which creates some copies. Okay, and here you can set the difference of position between each copy. Let's say I want 10 copies. And I'm going to translate them a little bit, for example, in this direction. Okay. Here I can toggle back to the single view, the single perspective view. And I've been, for example, a transform sub, which is going to either translate or scale or rotate my object. And, for example, rotate it like that, 90 degrees. All right. Okay. Home the view. This is a quick example, but there is enough for me to show you what I want to show you about the modeling workflow. Okay. Press P to hide the parameter view. So as I said, these nodes, at the same time as being operation, for example, revolving operation, a copying operation, an operation of transformation, etc., are at the same time geometry containers, which means that you have geometry inside them. And you can see that immediately if here you middle click on the middle of each node, you've got the contents, the geometry contents. Okay. We'll talk about this immediately. This is very different from the other software where you have on one side the object and on the other side the operation. For example, the transformation, well, the transformation contain also the geometry transformed. It is not like in Maya where you've got on one side the geometry and on the other side the transform of the object. Okay. Here, if you transform the object, your geometry is updated and geometry finds itself in the X from SOP, in here. Okay. It was here and now it's here. And it's not the same geometry anymore. So the objects, if you want, the geometry lives inside the nodes, as I said. And this is actually deeply related to the fact that Houdini is node-based. So I'll make a quick comparison with Maya. In Maya, you've got the interface, and the core of Maya is the hypergraph, which is a graph of nodes connected together. So Maya is the same way as Houdini, internally node-based. But the way it is node-based is very different from the way Houdini is node-based. Because in the hypergraph, what you have is you have a lot of different nodes and a lot of nodes of different types, okay? Plus, what you have is you have one node per geometric object. Plus, for each node, you've got a lot, a lot of different inputs and a lot of different outputs, okay? So, this is really difficult to master. I mean, this is extremely useful, but the hypergraph cannot be used as the default interface. It is used when the default interface leaves off and where you need to manually connect nodes together. But that cannot be the interface. And it is not its purpose. It's really two different approaches. Okay. That is just to say that the fact for Houdini to be node-based isn't everything. Because if you want the nodes to be your interface, they've got to be really easy to manipulate. And actually, this is the case 
For, for example, the types and the number of nodes must be reduced. And the idea is that the type of the input and the output in the modeling context are always the same. The inputs are always geometry. And they are not, for example, a parameter of the revolve operation, for example, uh, the vector of the direction. Okay, All the inputs and all the outputs of every geometry operation is geometry. So you pipe geometry here, you've got geometry there, and you output geometry. Okay. This is really important because this represents a huge simplification of the interface. The other thing is that you do not have one node per geometric object. For example, here in the copy sop or in this X form sop, you've got one node and yet you have 10 objects. Besides, these objects are not treated like individual objects. Well, in the case of NURBS, they are because NURBS surface is something you cannot divide. But if I change the type here to polygon, if I change back to polygon, and here if I middle click, I've got a certain amount, a certain number of points, of primitives, and of polygons. A primitive is, in the case of polygons, a face. Actually, a primitive, if you think of the points as the atoms, the primitives are the molecules, the most simple elements of geometry you can build upon atoms, which means that the primitive will be either the faces or the nerves curves or the nerve surfaces. But an edge, for example, is not a primitive. It's something to know. So you see that these nodes contain a certain number of polygons. This one as well. And this one as well. You see that they are not individuated in objects. You've got some geometry, some geometry inside your nodes. Okay. Which means that Houdini sees the same way one glass or ten glasses or an arbitrary number of glasses. It is for him some geometry, a quantity of geometry. So this brings immediately a question. How am I going to work on this particular glass or this one or this set of faces? Okay, And the answer will be through selections. and through groups. And selection and groups are a really advanced feature in Houdini which can be procedural. We can have procedural selection. For example, you can select one glass every two glass. This is procedurally defined. We'll see that in the next lesson. So this means that you can have up to a whole scene into a node. But of course you also use the natural separation you have between different geometric containers. Okay. But inside a geometric container you can have a really complex geometry. So this reduces the number of node you're working with. And it's a fantastic way to deal with complexity, with this complex scene that made the reputation of Houdini. Which means that the nodes here are not really numerous, but it can lead to some complex geometry. So we're going to talk about groups and selection in the next lesson, but let's uh, say a little word here already. What if I want to manipulate this glass? Well, actually, you've got an option with the copy sop, where you can assign a group, a different group name to each copy. Just press P here and here create output groups. So if now you middle click, this creates some primitive groups, some groups of faces if you prefer, and which correspond here to each class. So 
So if here I want to transform only this one or this one, I just have to here filter my operation to just for example group two. Okay, well actually I'm going to add another transform and to do that on the other transform. Translate by default like that, but apply this only to copy group 2. Okay. And this is how I access components, if you want, sub objects. But this also means that if you want to work on a single component, either a group or a face or a set of faces, well, you still have to send all the geometry to the operation. All the geometry is pipe and not just a subset. But the operation work only on a subset of faces, for example, or a subset of points or a subset of primitives. So what you always do or really often do when you model is you work on a selection, you work on some faces, you extrude them, for example. Where this means that in here you'll create a specific operation and filter it. Filter it to the particular selection you're working on. And you see that each node has as the first field this group field where you can filter your operation. For example, let's suppose I want to extrude these faces. I'm going to talk more about how I can select these faces. And if here I append a poly extrude sub, which is the sub that extrudes, here I can keep the point shared. You see that this happen the polyextrude operation to the whole geometry, but the polyextrude operation itself works only on these faces. Okay. You can display this faces number here. Okay. This is really important and this is related to the fact that the nodes represent the history and if you perform an operation on a subset, you're not going to lose all the rest. Okay, so here you've got the entire result. The entire result of a local operation, but on the global object. But you display the global object. Okay. And as I said, the same concept is applied in other contexts. For example, in the channel context where you deal with animation curves, double click. Here bring a motion view. You can work on one curve. And if you middle click here, you've got the contents of this operator. And you see that the channels, which are the animation curve, live inside a chop channel operator. Okay, here you've got one channel. You've got a lot of other information we are going to talk about later. But you can work the same way on an arbitrary number of curves. And this happens when you here I'm going to bring a geometry chop. When you work on the point coordinates of an object as separate channels. For example here Let's use this poly extrude sub and use here animated. Here you see that you have all the coordinates x, y, z of each point as separate channels. And as a result here you've got more than 3000 channels. Okay. I may reduce this number here 
if I reduce the number of copies, for example. Or let's keep the same number of copies, but work only on, okay, it's 10, on the revolve sub. Here, use instead the revolve sub. This makes 360 channels, okay. So you see that here the same way, you do not have one node, one chop per channel, but a chop can contain an arbitrary number of channels. And the same way you will have equivalent to selection, to working only on this particular channel, okay. We'll see that when we'll be talking about chops. And about uh, the compositing context, well, a node here, if you will click the same way, you've got the contents, but a node here cannot contain several images, but what it can contain is several planes, like C, like R, G, B, A, or additional planes, additional components, if you want. Okay, so this is the ID. The nodes are most of the time data containers at the same time as being operations. Let's go back to the modeling network, to the modeling level. Here, a thing. The inputs and the connection at this level at the object level do not have the same meaning as inside at the modeling uh, level. Here they represent parenting operation. For example, you parent this to this. I'm going to create another object, like here, a sphere object. And you know how parenting work in 3D. The behavior is that when the children move, the parents take home, but as soon as the parents decide to move, the children move with him. Okay. Okay, and parent them. So here you know how all the modeling operations work because they all work the same way. It's just a matter of creating a node, sending the geometry to another node, maybe filtering the selection etc etc you realize how far you already are in the learning process okay I mean what is left for you to know is more precisely how each operation each op is going to work but you know that it will always be a matter of sending the geometry filtering the operation okay plugging the nodes together Plus, here you see that the nodes are already organized in some categories. So, for example, if you want an operation on NURBS, you know where to find it. It's here. Okay. So, here we use the generators, which are in the primitive menu. Okay, you've got the box, the file, the grid, the torus, the metables. This is really important. Okay. You've got all the operations that work on polygons. They are here. Okay. All the operations that work on particles. All the operations that work on nerves. The skin sub is maybe the most useful. Here you've got all the operations that deal with creating uh, UV coordinates to apply some texture on some geometry. Here the manipulate is all the deformers if you want deform your geometry. The manager, we saw that. All the operation to work with hair, with fluid, with edges. The digital asset, which are the custom nodes. The cloth, the character, and the attribute, which is an important thing we are going to talk about very soon. Which are actually kind of the coordinates of each point, the attributes of each point, or each primitive, etc. So here it is, you've got an overview of all the modeling operations in one glance. 
and you know where to find them and you know what will happen when you use them okay I mean you know what Houdini will do when you use them so that you can feel much more confident already now in this lesson I'd like to show you some great uses of this new modeling approach and at the same time show you more about what we call the non-destructive approach of Houdini which is the fact that you can go back in the history of your operation modify something and have the whole result updated okay and what I'm going to do here I can hide this for the moment is to model a phone cord a spirally phone cord okay so everything will begin with a curve which will be the base of my spiral like that okay so I can double click okay so what I'm going to do to get this spirally look is to place cross section all along the curve but not exactly on the curve but around the curve at a certain position and with a certain angle which increases along the curve so that I get the spirally effect okay I could use the copy sub for that but instead I'm going to use the sweep sub which is better when we have to place copies along a path along a curve okay so first what I'm going to do is to change the type here to polygon and increase the number of points of this curve okay since each point is going to correspond to a copy to an instance of the cross section so to that end I'm going to use a resample sub which as the name says is going to resample my curve evenly spacing points here along the curve can change the length here but I can keep it to 0 1 like that and let's create a cross section a circle as the cross section change its type to NURBS curve and maybe reduce the radius for now and here just use a sweep sub S W E E P okay the sweep sub take three inputs which are all geometry of course I'm just going to use the first two inputs the first input if you middle click here is the cross section which is in our case the circle and the second input if you middle click is the backbone which is here this curve so I'm going to plug the circle here and plug the resample sub here okay so what I get here I can turn off the points and here I can change the display mode to smooth shaded smooth wire shaded it's better okay so here I've got a lot of cross section that I'm going to skin together here you can see I have more than 200 profiles 200 nerves curves all right and here you immediately see that I cannot take the usual approach where I would have to select each cross section that I want to skin because I've got more than 200 neither can I have 200 nodes that I'll have to plug together okay and yet I will be able to skin all the circles together what I'm going to do is here to use a skin sub which is very useful with NURBS and instead of connecting each cross section to the skin sub manually selecting each of one I'm going to send the whole geometry to the skin sub and tell the skin sub to skin everything there is to skin that is to say all the cross sections but the skin sub has to skin them in a proper order okay like connect this one with this one then with this one etc and now this one with this one and then with this one and then with this one okay so actually to skin a lot of curves like that the skin sub will use their primitive numbers 
can display it here. And here you can see 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, etc. Until here, 235. So the skin sub is going to skin all these curves in the order of their primitive number. Only here, as I said, I don't want to have the circles centered on the curve, but translate it a little bit and rotate it at sort of an angle which is increasing along the curve. So first I'm going to translate a little bit my circles, like that for example. And in the sweep up, I'm going to use the twist, which will create this angle which is increasing. Okay. Here I need to reduce the radius. Okay, something like that. And the skin sub is going to skin everything at once. Okay, like that. So you see that this would have been impossible with manual selections, okay, and with hundreds of nodes, okay. Here, use smooth shaded. Here I can change to YZ plane. Okay. And here is my spirally phone cord. And what I've done so far is constantly going back here on these nodes, changing the parameters like changing the radius, changing the orientation, or here changing the twist and displaying the final result. Okay, so this is the non-destructive approach. You modify something upstream in the graph and the whole result updates. Okay, like I can modify the curve, which is the generator, and the whole result updates. Okay. So you can have a huge network and you just play with one parameter on one node and you have all your modeling workflow updated, recooked. And as a matter of fact, in my 4-hour video called Procedural Modeling of Cities, I've pushed this ID to the level where you can redraw the map of a city, the planner map, the 2D map, and the whole city rebuilds itself in 3D. Of course, it takes a little more time but the concepts still apply. And this is the perfect time for me to talk about the different flags and the highlighting of the nodes. So when you work non-destructively, you've got the node you are working on and the node you display, okay? The node you're working on is highlighted in yellow like that. It can be the curve, for example like that. And the node which is displayed is the node which has this blue flag turned on. So it could be the sweep up. And I keep manipulating the curve. Okay. Here the node I'm working on and the node at display are the same. The node which is displayed, the node which has this blue flag turned on, is the one which is displayed at this level, at the level of the object. All right. Plus here you see this concentric circle. You've got a blue circle and you've got a purple circle. The blue circle is for the node which is being displayed, while the purple circle is for the node which is being rendered. They are often the same, but they can be separate nodes. And to set the node which is going to be rendered, you just press Ctrl. Here, for example, if it's the skin stop, if you press Ctrl, you already see that the flag here is changing its color and turns to purple. And in this case, this is the node which is going to be rendered, and this is the node which is displayed. Okay? Here, I'm not going to talk about rendering, but this would be the node to be rendered, right? Control. Okay. 
you see that we have three other flags. The pink flag here is to display some template geometry, that is to say some helper geometry. These are not geometry that are going to be reflected, that are not going to be displayed at this level, but is just to help you in your modeling process. Okay, and what you can do is to select several nodes and turn on the template flag for all these nodes at once. Okay. Now these two other flags. Here I'm going to add a transform sub and for example rotate the object. The first one is the yellow one which is the bypass flag which means if it's turned on ignore this node and everything happens as if this was plugged directly in here. You see this is the same. Okay. And you can bypass several nodes at once the same way. Okay. Finally here you've got the log flag which is to log the geometry that is to say it is not going to be updated by any change I make upstream, okay? For example, if I lock this geometry, it will always stay the same. Okay, I can modify the curve. This doesn't affect this node, okay? So, we saw how we can work non-destructively, how we can manipulate 1000 object as easily as one object. So this is extremely powerful, but as powerful as it is, it's not always the kind of thing you will have to do. I mean, not everything you have to do is procedural. When you model a face, for example, this is eminently non-procedural. This is typically destructive. And we'll see how in Houdini it's never destructive. I mean, it may look destructive if you do not see the nodes, for example, if you're working in the viewport, but ultimately Houdini will always keep track of what you do in the viewport. Okay? Besides, everything we've done so far was just a matter of working here in the network view and just creating nodes, plugging them together. Okay? This is kind of boring. I mean, this is not really interactive. This is not 3D. I mean, 3D is really about manipulating the objects in the viewport, really putting your hands in the 3D scene, okay, sometimes sculpting, digitally sculpting, okay, and of course these are things that we can do with Houdini, but the only thing is I had to show you the nodes first, because since everything is based on the nodes, what we will be doing here in the viewport will be translated in nodes and node connections, okay. This is really important, because this means what we do in the viewport is not another thing. These are two ways to do the same thing. Okay? And actually working visually is an even faster way to work in Houdini with the nodes. Okay? We'll see that and this is something that came up with Houdini 9 and which wasn't fully understood at first when Houdini 9 was released. So let's work very visually. So I'm going to maximize this pane and get rid of this network. Okay, maybe first I'm going to hide this object. Okay, and first I'm going to do something extremely simple. I'm going to create a grid and I'm going to extrude some faces of this grid. We'll talk about all the selection immediately, about all the options you have to select your components. But here I'm just going to select some faces like that. Okay, like that. So I first select my components and then I apply my operation which is a poly extrude. Okay. So if we take a look at how this has been translated here, you see that Houdini has appended a poly extrude SOP and in here has filtered the operation to this selection of faces, this selection of primitives. Everything happens as if here I had appended a polyextrude 
first plugged it like that and then typed the selection like okay I can control C and control V okay and here translate a little bit the faces okay to extrude so this represents two ways of working when I'm in the viewport I first select my components and I apply the operation so I'm kind of working locally while when I'm here in the network view I first bring my operation and then I filter it okay but both things are completely equivalent plus you have the benefit that when you are working visually you've got a lot of option to visually select your faces okay for example you have the box selection but you also have the lasso selection like that or the brush selection brush picking okay where you can adjust the radius of the brush here Alright, while here you have the benefit that you can use some nodes to create some groups, some procedural selection. Okay, and here instead of typing a pattern of numbers, you can type the name of a group of a procedural selection. Okay, we'll see procedural selection in the next lesson. So you see that here, that when you are working in the viewport, you can see your work as more of working on components, working locally, so you select your components and then you apply the operation with the benefit that your selection is visual so you can have the lasso selection, the brush selection, etc. While when you are working in the network view, you see more your work as filtering an operation which is already applied. So you first apply the operation and then you type your selection, but instead of typing these numbers, you can type names of groups okay but these two things are equivalent this is what I call the operation selection equivalence okay so now is the perfect time for me to talk about all these selection how do we select a primitive in the viewport how do we select a point in a viewport the first thing to know is that we have two main types of selection we've got the object selection we select at the level of the object and you've got the component mode selection. You select at the level of here, the network, the sub network, okay? And you toggle from one to the other by pressing F8, okay? F8, and you see how this view adapts to the type of selection we are using, okay? Here I'm in F8, I'm in object selection mode. F8 again, I'm in component selection mode, okay? And you see that here, there's something you can do here. Here I'm in object select mode, okay? And here I'm in, it will appear, geometry select mode or component select mode, okay? I'm going to go back to box picking. And in here, in the geometry select mode, you see that you can change from selecting points to selecting edges, selecting primitives, vertices, breakpoints, etc. And you see that each of these selection modes has an odd key associated, like 2 for the points, 3 for the edges, 4 for the primitives. Okay? So here I select primitive. If I want to select point, I press 2 and I select my points. If I want to select edges, I press 3 and I select edges. Okay? and four for my primitives, okay? I can talk about these three icons as well, which are very, very useful operation. The operation of translation, rotation, and scaling, okay? With the hotkey here, T, R, and not S, but E, okay? Where I can translate, rotate, or scale either an object or a component. A set of components okay like for example this selection of faces I can translate it press T and this brings me an edit sub 
which is actually maybe the only really destructive operator you will find in Houdini. What I mean by that is that if you now select another set of faces and this time rotates these faces, this will be counted as the same operation. Okay, so this is the node for tweaking the components of the geometry. Okay, if you go at the level of the object F8 and that you apply translate rotate or scale, this will be reflected in here as the global translate rotate and scale of the object. Like if I press T, okay. R and E. Okay? So, I'm going to delete this object and what I'm going to do is to work completely in the viewport and I'm going to model a simple chair. Okay? I'll start out of a grid, a simple grid. I'm going to reduce the number of rows and columns to 5 and 5 and maybe scale it a little bit, E, like that. So what I'm going to do first is to select all these faces and extrude them to create the seat of the chair. Okay, F8, select all the faces and append a poly extrude sub. Okay. Here you see that you have some options here, which are some of the options you will find here, which are the most used option among the one you find here. And among this option you've got the option output the back, output the back of the seat, output the back of the extrusion, so to speak. Okay. This closes the box if you want. Now I'm going to create the four feet of the chair. Here I can hide the grid. So I'm going to select these four faces. To add faces to this face that I select, I just press Shift and I add the face. This face, this face, and this face. Okay. So here I could call another poly extrude, or what I can do is to say repeat the same operation as the previous one, which is a poly extrude. Okay, so this is going to bring me another poly extrude, and to that I just press Q. This means repeat the same operation. Okay, repeat an operation of extrusion. Of course, this is a different extrusion. It won't repeat the exact same operation. Okay, perform another extrusion to scale the feet here a little bit, like that, and Q the last time, like that. I'm going to shift to flat wire shaded. All right. Now I'm going to create the back of the chair by extruding these two faces, so Q again. Okay, extrude them another time. And here I'm going to delete this face, so just select the face and press delete. I'm going to select this face and extrude it here. Move it like that. You can delete it as well. And here you can toggle to point selection mode to select these points and translate them a little bit so they are closer to these other points. Okay. And now I'm going to add a fuse sub to fuse all these points together. So select the points and append a fuse sub. Okay here the points are fused. Okay. So now what I can do is to subdivide my whole share. 
So, toggle back to face selection mode, primitive selection mode. Select all the faces and happen a subdivide. Sop. Okay, I can even adjust the number of subdivisions like that. Okay, this is not, of course, the prettiest of chair, but this is not the point. Okay, the point is to show you how we can work entirely visually, modeling entirely visually. So, if we take a look at how it has been translated, press H to home the view here. Houdini has added a lot of operations. Okay, all the poly extrude. This, when we delete the primitive, etc., etc. So, we worked very destructively in here, but it wasn't destructive. I mean, Houdini keep the track of everything we've done. And as a result, in here, we can go back in the history and, for example, move this or scale that or move this. So when we want to work non-destructively, we usually go into this network view and click on the object we want to modify and the whole result update. Now we'll see how we can also work non-destructively but in the viewport, immediately in the viewport. We can navigate through the history of the object directly in the viewport using page up and page down. Okay. So when we are here, we can go back in the history using page up and page down, completely ignoring the nodes. I mean, not completely ignoring them, but not seeing them. Okay. We can work non-destructively in the viewport. Of course, we can use page up and page down here. But here, this means that when we are here, we can navigate through the nodes using the viewport, okay? Which means that, in a way, the nodes are here as well, in front of you, in the 3D scene. I mean, if you take your, I would say, your network sensitive glasses, you can see more than the chair. You can see another dimension and see all the history of the objects right in the viewport and access it with page up and page down. Okay. If you add to that the fact that if you press U, you go back at the level of the object, you see how it adapts here. And if you press I, you go inside and then page up, page down. Okay. Here, let's copy and paste this object and translate it a little bit like that. Here. I click on this chair, press I, dive in the network, navigate, then press U, then select this chair, I, page up, page down, okay? You see how you can navigate through the networks of Houdini directly with the viewport, with the 3D scene. So the 3D scene becomes really an interface to navigate in Houdini. Plus, plus the object you are in, the geometry container you are in, is highlighted, or if you prefer, the other are ghosted, okay? This is to remind you of the fact that you are really in, okay, in a network, in an object container. And as a result, the other objects are not selectable, okay? To really remind you that cannot access them unless you go back at the level of the object and you select the other object and go inside the network I and page up page down okay and this new feature comes with a specific button in here where you can set the visibility of the object that are not the object you are working on okay like if I press I here you see that this object is ghosted so here you see ghost of the objects, which is the default, what you can do is to show all the other objects. This won't make them selectable, but this will display them the same way as the object you're working on, the selected object. 
or you've got the option where you can hide the other objects you're not working with. But this means that if I go back at the level of the object U, this brings me back the chair. And that if I select this chair and go inside, the other chair disappear. And U. Okay. So you can really see the viewport as a network navigator, okay? Using U and I using page down and page up to move here in the hierarchy and you can set the display of the objects that are not selected okay and this idea of using the 3d scene as really a, an interface has been pushed quite far in Houdini 9 and as a result now even the particles I mean the actual particle points are selectable which means that you can perform some particle operation completely visually. I'm going to show you that if I hide this and this. Let's create a, a particle system which is going to collide with a ground plane. So I'm going to first create a grid like that and create a particle system. I'm going to emit particles so to do that I'm going to use an emitter. I use it here but I can call it here let's use it here emitter and press enter this emits particles okay now I want to add some gravity to these particles so I'm going to go back at the level of the object F8 and apply gravity it asks me down below to select particle for gravity. I can select them, like here, really selecting the points, okay? And press enter, and now the particles are affected by gravity, okay? Now I want to make these particles collide with here, the ground plane. So I'm going to add a collision select particles for collision, so I select these particles, press enter and select object for collision, well this object okay and as a result it has created a gravity pop and a collision pop and you see that now the particles collide with the ground plane like that so you see how we can work very visually, very interactively with Houdini. So in this lesson I'm going to talk about all the procedural selection, that is to say the groups. And we already talked about the classical selection. What I call a procedural selection, let's do it this, is as opposed to the manual selections when you here manually select your objects like that and for example happen a poly extrude. Here see it creates a list of numbers. Well as opposed to a manual selection, a procedural selection is when you select by a certain condition like select all the points that have this color or select all the points that are above a certain height or select every three points, every four points or every n points or select all the faces that just have been extruded. And the fact that we can define this group procedurally means that they can update as the geometry update. For example, what I'm going to do here is to extrude some faces and I want to be able to change the faces that I extrude and yet I want to have all the front faces colored with a certain color, for example red, and all the side faces of the extrusion color with another color. Okay. And to do that, you see that the poly extrude here has an option where it can create procedurally some groups. The front group, the back group, and the side group. The front group contains all these front faces, the side group contains all these side faces, and the back group, well, there is no back group here, but there could be if here I output the back, which I'm not going to do. 
and these three groups are defined procedurally, which means that if I reselect my geometry, and to do that, I just type tilde and reselect my geometry, and press enter, the contents of the groups will change. Okay? Here you see that I have 39 primitive in extrude front. Well, if till here I reselect, here I now have 28 primitive in extrude front. Okay? So what I want to do is to color these front faces in red, for example. So I will append a color sub. Here use primitive and select red like that and apply these to only the extrude front okay then do the same for the extrude side faces use here primitive and here for example a green okay and apply that only to the extrude side okay now if I go at this level tilde I can reselect and the whole result update okay with the groups so while we are here I'm going to show you that you can select procedurally defined groups in the viewport by selecting one of their faces it's if it's a primitive group the only thing is that several groups can share the same primitive and here what I do is I select the primitive and here I'm going to choose extrude side and use here replace selection with group okay and I select the extrude side group or what I can do is I select nothing and here I select the group here extrude side and say add group to selection which means here add group to nothing which means select the group okay we've got two other options remove group from selection and here select contents common to group and selection but which are less often used okay so now I'm going to show you that a great way to create groups is to work with attributes because when you want to create a group you often want to, for example, group all the points or primitive that satisfy this condition. So, for example, select all the points that are above a certain height. So, we need to test this condition being above, for example, 0 0.5. This condition for each point. Okay? So, we need to have access to this information like the position for each point or to have access to the information about the color for each point or about the normal okay and that's what are attributes they are per point information per point values like the position is an attribute the color is an attribute the normal is an attribute but you can also have your own attributes that you define we have various ways to set the values of this attribute among which we have the point sub, which is a very, very useful sub in Houdini. And let's, for example, here, delete this and pipe the grid here to the point sub. And here, add a new attribute, a color attribute. If here, you middle click, you see that it has creating a point attribute called CD. Three, because it's three floats. Okay. Plus here, if you right click, and open the spreadsheet, the geometry spreadsheet, you see that here you've got the list of all the attributes of the points. And you've got CD, CD0, CD1, CD2, and which is set to 1 everywhere. Okay? And with the point sub, you can set the value of this attribute on a per point basis. Okay? By typing some expressions here. And these expressions are going to use some local variables like $tx, $ty, $tz. All the local variables must be prefixed with a dollar sign 
and are a way to call the attribute for a particular point, which means that this expression they appear one time in here are executed for each point. Okay, so this can lead to a different result for each point. As opposed to these parameters here, this classical parameter where you can type some expression as well, but which are executed once for the whole object. Okay, and the local variables for the position are $tx, $ty, and $tz. And here you use them to set the position of each point. Here you set the position here to the position by default, but in here I can type like 0 0.5, which will set the component for each point, the y component, to 0 0.5. Okay, but in here I can use another expression like random dollar pt dollar pt is the local variable for the point number which you see here okay these are the point numbers okay and this adds some noise to the geometry that is to say that the point sub opens the door to all the scriptable deformations with expressions or what we can type here is s noise tx, ty, and tz, okay, capital here, which is another noise function, okay. For the list of all these expressions, you can bring the help and in the home here, go under the expression where you find the list of all these expressions, but it's better if we see all these expressions along the video. Here, if you middle click, you see that the point isn't counted as a point attribute. Well, as a matter of fact, it is a point attribute, but it always exists. I mean, geometry cannot exist without positions. So you will work with the position like with any other attribute. Okay. Here I can create my own attribute using an attribute create, attrib create sub. Okay, and this attribute create sub lives with all the other here sub that can work with attributes. Attributes in Houdini are used for a lot of things. They are used, for example, to define UV coordinates to apply textures. Here, if I use, for example, a UV project or UV texture. It is going to create UV coordinates that you can see here. Okay, and if you middle click you see it has added a UV attribute, a three float attribute. So let's delete that and let's create our own attribute. Here you can set the name of the attribute. Um, going to call it attrib and you can set the local variable here like to say how it is going to be called with the expressions prefixed by a dollar sign here I'm going to type att which means it will be called dollar att if it's a float or if it's a vector here it will be called dollar attx dollar atty and dollar attz okay let's keep it as a vector here and let's type a random expression, random dollar pt plus, I don't know, 50. This number doesn't matter as long as here we have different seeds for this random function, like 150, and here, I don't know, 4 multiplied by pt minus anything. Okay? And here you can see it has created attribute x, attribute y, attribute z. Okay. What we can do now with Houdini 9 is we can display any custom attribute in the viewport using this little icon. But first we need to call the display option panel, so press D, and go under here at the custom tab and use 
either create attribute text or create attribute vector. If you use create attribute text, this will display the three floats as three floats. And if you use here attribute vector, it will display the three components as a little vector, as a normal. Okay. So here, edit. Here you can edit the name of the icon or of the operation. At the attribute name is at shrib. Okay, so click accept. And if here I turn it on, it display the three floats for each point. Okay, press D. And if here I use vector, use at shrib here. Okay. And here, turn off this, but turn on vector. It display the three component, uh, the three components of a vector of a little line, as the normals. Okay. Now, if I want to use this attribute to set the value of another attribute, for example, another custom defined attribute, I can use the attribute create. And I can type in here an expression using the local variable here. For example, I can create a new attribute like new at new at okay three floats and here use attx attty and a T T Z, okay. If you open the spreadsheet, you have the same values here and here, here and here, and here and here, okay. You can also use the attribute create to modify the value of an already existing attribute. For example, of the CD, it will actually overwrite the values of the attribute. And as a result, this is read by the display engine. And you see the colors. Okay. So the attribute create is also attribute modified if you want. You can also modify the values of the attributes. Now with these attributes I can create some groups. For example, create a group with all the points which are above a certain distance or below a certain distance. Like here, I'm going to use the groups up. The groups up has a lot of options. Here I can create primitive groups or point groups. Here I set the name of the group. I can group by pattern, which means typing the actual numbers. But I can group by range will see that and I can group by expression which is what I'm going to do now and here type an expression ty dollar ty superior to zero so it will test the condition for each point and make a group out of all the point whose y component is superior to zero okay here make a point group I'm going to pipe it directly here And here you see that it creates a group at of all the points that are above zero. Okay. We'll see that better if here we increase the number of rows and columns. Okay. Here is the group. But of course this group can update if here I change, for example, the expression. Okay, the group is updated. With all the point whose y coordinate is positive. Now what I want to do is to apply all these concepts to 
the creation of a little scene where we've got a railway here that goes through valleys and mountains. And what I want to do is to set the altitude of this railway to a constant. And if this value is superior to the altitude of the landscape, we've got valleys and here we create a bridge. And if it's the contrary, if the railway has to go inside the mountain, here, dig a little tunnel, as well as here. Okay. This will of course involve procedural selection, conditional selection, like select all the points or all the faces that are below a certain altitude or over a certain altitude. Okay. Plus what I want to do is to have control here over the path of the railway like that. I want the result to update accordingly. Okay. And I want here to be able to set the number of posts like what I want to do is to say here use flat wire shaded place a post every n faces like that okay I want to be able to change this n okay and at the end I'd like to paint a little river and to paint the deformation induced by this river okay and this will also involve procedural selection so this is a scene where we will find a lot of different procedural selection and a lot of different types of procedural selection. So I'm going to close that and I'm going to start a brand new scene. Okay? So here, as it begins to be often the case, I'm going to start with the grid. Okay? And I'm going to increase the number of rows and columns to, let's say, 50 and 50. And I'm going to deform this onto a fractal landscape using a mountain sop. So just bring a mountain sop. Yeah, here I don't like the frequency, so what I'm going to do is to reduce the frequency. Actually, I'm going to reset the frequency to zero and slowly increase it like that. Like that, and increase the height. Maybe a little more. Okay, this will be my landscape. So now I'm going to create the path of the railway. So create a curve like that, which goes roughly like that. Okay, I'm going to translate it a little bit here. So it will be properly projected. Double click and here change the type to NURBS. And as before, I'm going to increase the number here of points using a resample SOP. Okay. Maybe use 0 0.2 here. And instead of projecting this onto the mountain, I'm going to first create a little strip, a little ribbon and then project the ribbon on the mountain, okay? So what I'm going to do here is to create a little cross-section, a line, which has to be 1, 0, 0, like that, and to use a sweep sop as before. So this is the cross-section, and this is the backbone. Of course, here I may reduce a little bit the distance Okay, so I can skin the result using a skin sop, but the sweep sop allows me to skin the result already. If here I go under sweep output and skin unclosed, like that. So this is what I'm going to project on the surface. So there are several types of projections I can use with Houdini. You've got the ones that use the minimal distance from the point to the surface it will be projected onto. And you've got the ones that use a specific direction. And this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to use the normals of each point to set the direction along which each point will be projected. Okay. So go in here. So I need to set the normal so that they are all pointing down. Okay. Here, you see that the normal doesn't exist yet. 
So here I'm going to use a point sop, for example. And here add normal and set the normal to 0, minus 1, 0. 0, minus 1, 0. Okay. So now I'm going to project this onto the mountain. I can do that at the object level or at the sub level. We'll do both actually. And here we'll do that at the object level. Here we already selected the object to project. And here append a ray operation. And here select the geometry to project onto this. Okay, so this is projected on the landscape. And here you see that Houdini has imported all the contents of the other node in here, in the curve object, and has fused both objects together. Okay, so we just have one object now. This is typical from Houdini 9. This is where we are going to group points, all the points that are below a certain altitude, and all the ones that are over a certain altitude. Actually, we just need the ones that are below a certain altitude. We just need half of the points. And to do that, I'm going to use a group SOP and group by expression. Okay? I'm going to name the group below. The entity type is points. Okay? And here, group by expression. And the expression will be ty inferior to percent value, for example, 2, or increase the value or reduce it, yes, like that, it seems about right, okay. It is recommended that here you save your scene under your Houdini directory, the place where you install Houdini, under, for example, railway.hip, and click accept, okay. And now what I want to do is to be able to convert this group of points to a group of primitives. And to do that, I can go under the Edit tab here, and you see a Convert tab, Convert type Primitive to Point Group, or Point Group to Primitive Group, which is what we're going to choose. And here, use Below, Convert it to Prim Below. Of course, we want to keep the below group, so we preserve original, and we want to only include the primitive with all the points in the group, okay? So this gives us one point group and one primitive group, okay? Now what I want to do is to kind of unproject here my surface, now that I've created my groups, Okay, using a point sub and set the altitude to here the value we used here minus three. Okay, minus three. Okay, we can display that. Of course, we still have our groups. Okay, here, go back in this group to see the actual groups, okay. What I want to do is, inside this group, select one primitive or one face every n faces, okay. I cannot create a subgroup of a group, but what I can do is to create a group with a face every n faces and to intersect it with this group. Okay, and this is what I'm going to do. Here I'm going to create a group. Here I can call this operation below group and this operation every n group. Okay, and here select one primitive 
every n primitive. And to do that, I'm going to use here group by range. Okay, I'm going to rename it to every n. And here you've got the bounds of the range. Dollar n is the total number of points or primitive. And here you can select one every n. Okay, like every six primitives. So I'm going to create a last group with the intersection of these two groups using another group sub. And here, call it result. And here, go under the combine tab and say result equals every n intersected with prim below. Okay. So you see that we find every n, but only in this region and this region. Okay. Here, before I extrude this to create the pose of my bridge, I want to extrude all the faces to give some thickness to the railway, or at least to the bridge. So I'm going to add a poly extrude. And here, see how the poly extrude work? Here, you see the primitive numbers. Here I'm going to use global. And if here I output the back, well, use wireframe. Here, here you see that the primitive numbers hasn't changed. Okay. So the group is still here. Okay. Maybe reduce a little bit the thickness. Okay. So I can now poly extrude these faces of my group. So use the group here, result. And here it is. Okay, I'm going to go back to flat shaded. Here it is. Okay, I can go back here and play with the number here of feet of my bridge. Okay. So I am going to reduce the amount of extrusion here, like 0 0.05, and project this point onto here, the mountain. Okay. So what I'm going to do is to use the properly defined group that the poly extrude creates for me and use here the group which contain all the front faces of the extrusion. Okay. You find here under our groups, create output groups. Okay. The front group, the back group, and the side group as we saw before. So the front group is here the side group is here and there's no back group okay but these are primitive groups okay you can see that here we've got 13 primitives in the extra front so I want to convert that into a point group so I will happen a groups up where I say here under edit primitive to point group use the extrude front and give a new name to this group extrude front P like points or points and I want to preserve the original okay so this is the group of points I want to project onto the mountain so to do that I'm going to use a ray sub but this time at the level of the subs okay let's move this a little bit and the ray sub takes two inputs, the geometry to project here, that we can filter with the group, and the geometry to project onto, okay, pipe it here. Actually, I may change here the shape of the mountain 
So what I'm going to do is to insert here a null SOP so that if I insert here new nodes, I will just have to plug the result one time, okay, to the null and not to each ray SOP, okay. The null SOP doesn't do anything, it's just here to help you doing your connection of nodes, okay. Here we can call it mountain shape, okay. If you press C, you can even color it like that, okay. Press C to hide this. And of course I want to only project here extrude from points. And you see how it is projected on the surface. Okay. Plus here, I want to create some little feet, some little bases at the beginning of each post. And I'm going to use the lift option in the race up. And lift a little bit. Oh, 0.1. Okay. And to re extrude the geometry here. So I'm going to extrude only the extrude front faces. Okay. So bring a poly extrude, another one, and use extrude front. Okay. Scale a little bit like that. And I'm going to extrude these faces here another time. But these faces are the faces that are procedurally defined out of this poly extrude, this new poly extrude, okay? So I need to create some other groups. Of course they need to have some other names here. Like extrude front 2, extrude back 2, and extrude side 2. And I will use extrude front 2 for the new poly extrude, okay? Here, use extrude front 2. Okay, use global like that. Okay, 0 0.1. Okay, we can see that with the mountain shape. All right. We can here, of course, play with the shape of the mountain, okay, like changing the offset. You see how it adapts, okay? Now I want to create my tunnels. Here, display the mountain. So what I'm going to do is to use a Boolean operation using the geometry of the mountain and the geometry here of just the railway, not of this, okay? But this means that the geometry of the mountain must be not planar, but really solid geometry, closed geometry, okay? So what I'm going to do here is to extrude my mountain using here global again like that here you see that the back is missing okay output back here when I perform a boolean operation I need to be really careful about the normals and here you see that the normals are actually pointing inwards I need to correct that and to do that I'm going to use a reverse SOP so that they are pointing outwards like that. And I'm going to compute a Boolean operation with this and here I'm going to go at this level make this even thicker to have the volume we are going to remove from the mountain. Okay, So I'm going to add another poly extrude sub 
and apply to the extrude front faces of this poly extrude. Okay, so create another set of groups. Okay, three, three, and three this time. And extrude only extrude front three. Okay, like that. This determines the whole volume, which I'm going to intersect with the mountain. Okay, so to intersect, to perform a Boolean operation, I'm going to use the cookie SOP, which is the SOP which performs the Boolean operations. You've got two inputs. The order of the inputs is not relevant as long as here you specify the type of Boolean operation. Okay. connect them like that and what I want is here B minus A B minus A and this creates the tunnels okay now what is left for me to do here is to merge these two results together okay using a merge sub which takes an arbitrary number of inputs Okay, and merge them together, create an object out of the reunion, if you want, of the two objects. Okay. Now I can play with the different parameters, like with the curve. Okay. You see how it digs tunnels. Okay with the number of posts okay, or with the shape of the mountain okay. okay so this is nice and you see that without procedural selection, it would be impossible to have this kind of control, this kind of result. Now I want to show you another example of procedural selection that I can create with the paint sop. Just go back here at the level of the shape of the mountain here. And what I would like to do is actually to paint here a little river the idea is that when I paint, I color my surface, and that when I color my surface, I actually set the value of an attribute, the color attribute, so I can use the result then to perform some procedural selections, okay? So here I'm going to use the paint sop, okay, maybe subdivide here my mountain to have a better result when I paint. Okay, plug this here, and the paint sub here comes with a lot of options. You can say the size of the brush, how it reacts to pressure if you use a Wacom tablet, okay. You can set the color you use, you can paint, smooth, erase changes, etc. Here we'll just set the color to paint with to blue, okay real blue, 001, and we're going to paint here our river, okay, maybe increase the size of the brush, and let's just paint here, okay, the river that goes like that, okay, like that, I can shift to smooth shaded mode, okay, and now the ID is that here you see that it created a point attribute is to create a group here which will contain only the blue points okay here since white is 111 and that blue is 001 what I'm going to do is select all the points whose red component the first component is different from 0 it could be the second component okay so I'm going to use group by expression here, use river, can be 
a primitive group or a point group. I want a point group here. And type the expression $CR different not equal to 1. And here I get my point group, okay? The great thing is that if here I reset all the changes and if I repaint here, you see that it reselects actually some points. I paint a selection of points, okay? Which is very, very useful. We'll see. Okay? Because now what I can do is actually to transform this point using a soft transform. Soft transform SOP. Works like the transform SOP, only it adds a little fall off, a smooth fall off to the selection and to the transformation you apply to your selection. So if I plug this to the soft transform and if I select my river group, okay, you see that first it has expanded my selection, which is very useful. And here you can use this color to perform some other procedural selections. Okay. And if here I translate here, you see that it soft translates, okay, it adds a little fall off to the transformation. Okay. So that here it creates steep riverbanks like that. Okay. So here the soft transform modify the color of the geometry but it only do that interactively and this is lost if here I happen for example a null soft okay but you can tell Houdini to keep the track here and to keep the color okay so there are a lot of things that you can create out of a procedural selection defined by a paint soft but this is not all okay if you combine this Process selection with the non-destructive approach, what you can do if here, if I reset the changes, I can paint my deformation. Okay. Yeah, maybe increase here this value. Okay which means I can paint virtually any sequence of operation onto some geometry. Actually, to paint the selections onto which I'm going to apply this operation. You can imagine that, for example, you paint delete or you paint subdivide, <laughs> anything you want. You paint deform, you paint mountain, okay? This really gives an artistic touch to Houdini node-based workflow, okay? You can paint operations. Reset all changes. Okay. You sculpt your landscape, okay? Now, I don't want to keep the visualization, okay, just like that. Now, what is left for me to do is here to plug this to here the input of this null sub, okay. Okay, so like this, 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 this and this. Okay, move this here. And pipe this here. Okay. So it changes the geometry onto which here the curve is projected. Okay. Here it may have messed the result. So to clean the result, you can happen a face sub, which will clean the normals and the topology. Okay, pre-compute normals. 
can also post compute normals. Okay, and do the same here. Happen a face at sub. Pre compute normals. Okay, and post compute normals. Because here what I'm going to do is to make unique points to have independent faces actually. So that it is not affected by smooth shading. Okay. So we have flat shading for the bridge and smooth shading for the mountain, okay? And let's pipe this here and this here and display the whole results. Full screen, it's even better, okay? And we can play here. Okay, so we can play now with here the path. Okay, with the number of posts. Okay, etc. etc. This, of course, would have been impossible without procedural selections. So with this lesson, you've got all the elements, the tools and, and the mindset to get started on a real-world project with advanced modeling in Houdini. So I hope you enjoyed this video and you can check our other Houdini videos at www.cmivfx.com. And see you there. Bye.